You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. Welcome along to a new episode of the Straight to Video Podcast. So MySpace, hands up if you're in, because I loved that website. It was kind of our gateway to social media, and for anyone in a band, it really was a golden time. For me personally, I've made many lifelong friends over the world through that thing. Good old Tom, he was a good guy, right? One cool band I made contact with through MySpace was a band from Toronto, Canada, called Frankie White and the Dead Idols. This was back when our band Teenage Casket Company was all-encompassing in all I did, but we, and I guess along with a bunch of other bands, found ourselves in weird waters. We didn't really fit into any particular scene. We all liked different stuff and just played what we enjoyed. I guess we were just a rock and roll band. Frankie White and the Dead Idols were just that too, a great kick-ass rock band. Frankie and I have stayed friends ever since, but we've never had the chance to talk face-to-face, or at least face-to-face over a computer screen. So it was super cool to catch up recently and hear all about her awesome journey in music so far. All the cool people who have influenced her and who she's worked with, to where she is now, and also, more importantly, discussing various parts of the Halloween horror franchise. So I hope you guys enjoy my straight-to-video chat with Frankie White. <laughs> Your room looks so badass. <laughs> Dude, it looks so good. I I feel underprepared. We're only doing audio. It's fine. That's true. No one can see my couch and my lack of uh, metal sludge paraphernalia. There you go. <laughs> I'm so happy to meet you finally. I know. Crazy, right? Yeah. Like, it's so weird that we've never spoken voice to voice um, after knowing you for Go on. <laughs> over a decade. It's got to be, right? It's got to be. Because, like, my space was, I mean, forever ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, I'm just, like, super happy to, to finally meet you. Because you and Joey Strange are two bass players that I, like, deeply admire. You guys have, like, such sick tone. And you seem like incredible people, incredible humans. And uh, you guys know each other, right? Oh, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So, yeah, MySpace. What a wild ride. Definitely. So uh, let's let's dive in. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and raised. Are you someone who's moved around a lot? Yeah, so I'm from Toronto, Canada. Basically like a bustling metropolis. Very diverse, I think. Near 50% of our population are like new Canadians, which is pretty cool. So I, yeah, so I'm from Toronto, downtown, born and raised. Totally a product of city living, city life. Um, I'm a product of pavement and density. You know, my childhood was basically blue slushy tongues and guitars and skateboards and original Nintendo consoles and and city life, you know? Yeah. So were you right in the city? You're not in like a suburb? No, no, I'm downtown. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Have you got brothers and sisters or anything like that? Or only child? Yeah, I have four. Yeah. No, I'm the youngest of four. Yeah. How was that growing up? Uh, it was pretty cool. Like, um, they're all quite a bit older than me. So I grew up in the 90s and my siblings grew up in the 80s. So for me, I have a really strong education in 80s pop culture because, you know, by the time I was nine, 10 years old, my siblings were moved out and had left behind their, you know, VHS tapes Mm -hmm. and video games and (laughs) and records, basically. So, I mean, it was a very diverse household in regards to what everyone was into, you know, my Mm -hmm. brother. So I have twin brothers, you know, one was into rock music, one was into hip hop. And then my eldest sister was into like really heavy industrial, uh, industrial music. And then the next youngest to me, 
my other sister, she was into like super pop, like Disney soundtracks. You had like the full spectrum then. Totally, totally. Yeah. So when I was really young, you, you could, you know, like walk down a hallway and hear, you know, everyone had their door shut, but like hear like various clashing soundtracks going on. What was the first thing that kind of grabbed you? Probably rock and roll. Uh, my first record was Smashing Pumpkins. Yeah. Like Melancholy. This is when I start feeling like really old. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny dude uh yeah because melancholy would have been like i don't know mid to late 90s so yeah that was my first record followed by the black album metallica and then a canadian band uh the, are you familiar familiar with the tragically hip i do know the name all right cool well yeah so those three records were were kind of like my first records in regards to like when you go to the music store and you pick things out yourself and you buy them yourself you know so rock and roll punk rock right away kind of rubbed off on me I don't know if it was any kind of... I remember my brother, John, introducing me to Napster. Right. I don't know if my siblings were ever sat me down and were like, hey, listen to this, because they were teenagers. They were they were young adults. They were kind of doing their own thing. But I do remember my brother, John, being like, you can type anything in here and you can access any kind of music. And at that point, I was like elementary school. And I just remember being like, whoa. That opened up a whole a whole world yeah. to me for sure. Yeah. Was music always like your very earliest passion? Because I think it's something... You you posted on Facebook that you had an interest in making movies. Yeah, cinema to me was really important pre-music, like prior to uh, discovering my passion for like playing guitar before I started playing guitar. I was kind of like captivated by the process of creativity and expression and storytelling. And I gravitated heavily towards people who were behind the scenes. Right. Um, so for me, that was... Chris Carter, he created The X-Files. John Hughes, Stephen King, David Lynch, Spielberg. Like I really gravitated towards the people who went into like making this thing as opposed to like the final product. Yeah, so for me, making movies and as a kid, before I started playing guitar, I wanted to direct movies and I wanted to write movies. And uh, I spent a lot of time, you know, walking around my, my driveway with, you know, a beat up old video camera that yeah. was my dad. My dad like taking home movies and just like making my friends do you know, acting stuff out yep. for me or whatever. Yeah. Is there any evidence of that still around? Yeah, I actually had a conversation recently wondering where those tapes were with one of my uh, my best friend. Yeah, they've got to be around somewhere. I do still have scripts. Like I yeah. have like hundreds of pages of scripts that I wrote when I was a kid. What kind of genre of, because all those people you've mentioned, it's quite a cross section. Yeah, I think uh, for me, what resonated most with me was things that were kind of left of center. So genre wise, I mean, how would you categorize the Lynch stuff? It's not like mm. horror. It's <laughs> yeah. not, it's, it's kind of weird, yeah. right? It's just that genre where things look one way, but they're actually mm -hmm. another. Was you a Twin Peaks fan as well then, if you like, David? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did totally. you see the recent series? I haven't seen the recent series yet. Did you? Yeah. Okay. It's friggin' weird. I was kind of like waiting for it to start and I'm like six or seven episodes in. I say you right. just don't know where it's going, but you just want to keep watching. It's great. I wonder if it's on Netflix Canada, dude. I'm not sure. I got to check that. Yeah, it's great. I got like the box set of it a few years ago and yeah, it, it's awesome. Totally different to what you expected it to be. I mean, that's in true, true Lynch yeah. fashion. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What were your favorite films then? Was it from people who you mentioned like Spielberg and David Lynch and John Hughes? Yeah, I would say that I had Blue Velvet and Lost Highway on VHS, which I think I was like really too young to be watching those. But there you have it. You know, I was probably like <laughs> nine years old. Obviously, E.T. is one of my favorite films. Stand By Me and yeah, the Hughes stuff strongly resonates with me for sure. Which are your favorite John Hughes films? The Breakfast Club for yeah. sure. Because everyone seems to have different ones when you ask people. Yeah, well, what's yours? Mine's Weird Science. I freaking love it. I think it's just because me and my best friend just used to quote it all the time. Dude, so I went back and watched that again. Well, not too recently, but maybe over the past two years. And I swear in the credits, uh, Jimmy Iovine was involved in that somehow. Right. Like Jimmy Iovine from like Interscope. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. That just blew my mind that he... Unless there's another Jimmy Iveen. I mean, don't quote me on this who, if people are listening. Like, <laughs> it might be another Jimmy Iveen, but I remember. The, so, the last time I watched it, I let the credits scroll and that just blew my mind. Did the um, Van Halen song uh, make it into that cut, Pretty Woman? Because that's one thing that changed. Wait, what? Where they're going um, up and down the escalators and they see Kelly LeBrock coming up and they're going down. In one of the original ones, they had uh, Pretty Woman by Van Halen playing. Oh, really? Yeah, and I think it must have been a, I don't know, some weird contractual thing. They just changed it for the title song. Oh, that's so funny. I didn't know that. Cool. Probably weren't willing to pay the thousands of dollars. Yeah, totally. For Warner Brothers or something like that. It's true. It's true. So um, 
I say, I've seen you mention and quote like John Hughes films and Stand By Me, you've quoted that before. Was any of that kind of primed for songwriting influence, do you think, at any point? Yeah, my my impression of adulthood uh, when I was a kid was that adults like lose the ability to attune to imagination and emotion and and feeling so like the catcher in the rye for example the way that's articulated in the catcher in the rye is like holden caulfield talking about phonies right in john hughes movies ali sheedy's character in the breakfast club reflects on that when she says when we grow up our heart dies so i remember like quite clearly saying to myself as a kid never forget what this feels like like never forget what it feels like to experience the world as a child. You were saying that when you was really young, you was thinking that. When I was really young, like eight, nine, ten years old, I wanted to remember like the pain and the wonder and the sensitivity of being a child because my experience of adults was that they were unable to attune to that. So I think those films in particular, uh, the Hughes stuff, Stand By Me, amazing film. And, you know, based on the amazing book, The Body by Stephen King is one of my favorite novellas. So I think those films, those stories in particular, still strongly resonate with those parts of me, that part of me that says, don't forget what this feels like to be a kid Mm -hmm. and to experience the world that way. So I think to answer your question, long story short, I think those parts of me invariably end up in songwriting somehow, right? And those stories, like those stories help me get in touch with those feelings again. I love that. I love the fact that you you were smart enough to pick up on that so young. Probably me included. It's like something which you realize later on. It's like, I want to grab that magic back now. Now I'm older. I've realized it. Right. To find it when you were young. That's that's awesome. Cool, man. Cool, cool, cool. So was you a big video store kid or am I showing my age? No, I was a huge video store kid. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I feel like, I think I'm the last, so I'm a, I'm a millennial, but I think I was the last generation who grew up without social media. There was an independent video store right around the corner from where I lived. And I equated going to the video store with how it felt to go to record stores. Yeah. Like I love being, sur- like, I don't know about you, but I just love being surrounded mm-hmm. by like these things that had been made by people and like poured into by people. So like looking at the covers and just like walking around and spending hours just looking at the covers and the posters and stuff like that. It was a lot of fun. Making the right choice. Yes. You know, <laughs> you only have so much money. You know, you have like three to five bucks to rent a video. Mm-hmm. What are you going to spend it on? Was the one which you rented several times a go-to, do you think? A lot of science fiction stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The alien stuff I did love as a kid. It freaks me out a bit now. All of those are totally different, really. The alien movies. I mean, the original. That one still holds up as well. We saw that in the cinema maybe about 18 months ago, and I was impressed at how well it held up. Definitely, definitely. I mean, would you classify those as truly science fiction? Uh, Like part monster movie, part science fiction? I remember Aliens, the sequel, terrified me as a kid. Yeah. To the point of like a horror film kind of scary. Yeah, 100%, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, those movies, uh, I had an affinity for the original Halloween, John Carpenter stuff. I still have, this is kind of sacrilege, but this is like a movie that I grew up with. Right. Which I've not seen that since it came out. So you've only seen it once? Yeah. Okay. So to everyone listening, I'm holding up a VHS tape of Halloween H20 or H2O. Mm -hmm. That was the return of Jamie Lee Curtis the first time around. (laughs) Right, right, right. right. So this movie was 98. So this was like my gateway to Halloween. Yeah. So this is a movie that I rented often. So when I saw this movie in theater, in the first 10 minutes, I would have been 98, like 11, 11 years old, maybe. Anyway, in the first 10 minutes, I was so scared that I left. Really? It's the only time I've ever left a movie. And then I went back. I proceeded to watch that movie in theaters like a number of times because (laughs) I left and because I let the fear conquer me. I was like, no, I got this. And then I started renting the movie over. It was was like exposure therapy. That's the great thing about horror films, though, especially when you're a kid. It's like they terrify you, but you just want to keep watching. Totally. You're like, I got to get through this. Yeah, it's just the best. So are you a big horror fan then? I'd say I'm a bigger sci-fi fan. I don't watch too many horror movies anymore. Uh, I do still love horror movies from my youth, which are like the Stephen King stuff, like Pet Cemetery. Yeah. Like Carrie. Like Misery is not a horror movie. It's more like a psychological. Yeah, but it's The great. Shining, it's like psychological mm-hmm. thrillers, right? Like I, I, I like, again, movies that are, there are a number of layers going on to them. That's what I love about music too. Like certain projects that have like a number of layers to them, like records that you can listen to a number of different times and notice different things about it every time. Um, so those kinds of films too, 
I'm not a huge fan of like the straight up slasher. No. No. You? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Okay. What do you love about it though? Some become a little bit too. I've never been a massive Halloween fan. I, I find the first one overrated. I respect it wow. for what it did and what it kind of set up, but um, I've never got it as to why he's trying to kill Jamie Lee Curtis. Oh, so you feel like there's like a narrative flaw. <laughs> I don't know why he's trying to kill her because she's his family. That's true, dude. That's true. You know, I don't think I've put that much thought into it. Um, that is fair. The new one was pretty good. It did the job. Yeah, yeah, I actually really enjoyed it. See, I don't watch horror movies anymore, but I did go back and watch, not go back, but I did watch that, the latest Halloween. And I thought it was pretty cool to explore that ptsd yeah angle right because that would be that would be realistic for someone to have gone through that kind of yeah. trauma which people do go through which is wild i've no idea what they're going to do with the next one to try and bring him back yeah so yeah <laughs> michael never dies so that's what i that's one of the things that i enjoyed about h20 is that at the end of h20 spoiler alert at the end she beheads him yeah there ain't much coming back from that <laughs> right but no here he is back again but my understanding of the the latest one was that it, it's supposed to pick up where the first one left off. Mm -hmm. Even wipes out part two, apparently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically forget everything that happened in between because, you know, those movies are a product of corporate exploitation. We can keep it Halloween 3 because that's totally separate. Is it? Yeah. John Carpenter had nothing to do with that, though. I think he had something to do with it, didn't he? That was the whole plan. Because Halloween 3 is the one which has no Michael Myers in it. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, there's like, is there 11 or 13? I have no I'm idea. I'm getting them mixed up, dude. Friday the 13th used to have a lot, but I think Halloween's pretty much catching up with it now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. My impression was that Carpenter only was involved with the first one and then it got taken out of his hands and he didn't want anything to do with it for a while. But I don't know. I'd... I know with part three, they wanted it to be, right, we've done the first two. Now we're just going to do a Halloween film, which is a standalone film each year. Okay, okay. Which is a brilliant idea, but people thought it was terrible. Right, like they would do a standalone film each year around Halloween. Yeah, which is, I think is great, but people wanted the guy in the mask back again. Wow, I did not know that. So they were trying to make it into like a series. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a cool idea. Yeah, it's a great idea. And I love the film. Halloween 3 is great. So you love Halloween 3, but you don't love Halloween yes. 1. Okay, <laughs> fascinating, dude. Dude, the score was legendary though. Oh yeah, yeah. I say I totally appreciated what it did and yeah, I don't know. Maybe because I saw it after I'd seen Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th. I think Halloween was the last one. Oh, okay. That's cool. We don't have to agree. <laughs> So when did music become the main focus then from your love of films? When was that kind of crossover? Like around nine years old, eight, nine years old. I started my first band at nine, actually. That's crazy. Most people don't even get Is into that? music. Yeah, I think so. Really? I don't know, dude. Like, when did you start your first band? I didn't pick up a guitar till I was 16. Oh, okay, that's crazy. I mean, I started... <laughs> so I was around professional musicians growing right. up, family, friends, and living in such a big city, just professional musicians everywhere. Um, so maybe that played a big part in it. But yeah, I started playing drums. At, I think I asked my mom for a drum kit at eight years old. And yeah, so she was like, we'll rent one because you know, if this is a phase, then I don't want to invest in, you know, drum kits or they can be pricey. Yeah. So, I mean, I was attracted to music through the desire for self-expression, I think. And, you know, when you're in elementary school, you're experimenting with all kinds of different art. So whatever degree that you can, but you're being exposed to like art class, like drawing and music. But for like music, you know, when I was a kid was like recorder, you know? Mm -hmm. So for me, just I gravitated towards music. I, you know, my eldest sister, she's an amazing artist. She can draw like crazy so yeah I there was one other kid in my elementary school who was also a guitarist like had been playing guitar like we were eight but he had already been playing guitar for a while yeah his name's David Kleiser he has an awesome band called I think it's called the walls are blonde he's an amazing visual artist an amazing uh musician out of Montreal um so we started a band together just grew my like my passion grew from there I think it was really fostered by there was a vintage guitar store in Toronto called Songbird Music when I was a kid. That's closed now, unfortunately, uh, like an independent vintage guitar store. So I just started like loitering around yeah. because the gear was just like, there's something so exciting about being surrounded by uh, these, be like instruments are beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They smell amazing. They look amazing. So just like being around instruments was so thrilling uh, for me that I would like stop going to school and just like go downtown. At that time, it was a really kind of like rough area. 
area, Queen Street West. And uh, I would just like hang out in this music store. And there were actually record stores across the street from Songbird Music. Now, the cool thing about Songbird, actually, before I get into the record stores, the cool thing about Songbird was there were a number of working Toronto musicians who worked in that store during the day. So there was a drummer, John McCann, who played with Guided by Voices for a bit. So he worked at that store. Um, a number of like amazing uh, Canadian artists, someone named Andrew Aldridge, who's heavy into the looping scene here. Just really strong musicians who made like significant contributions to the community here. They were all working at that store. And I think in a way they were kind of like, by that point in my life, my siblings had moved out and were like doing university and all that. So I think this store kind of became like my pseudo family. And these were all kind of like my brothers who were like looking out for me in this weird area of town. And uh, when I would leave at the end of the day, when I would <laughs> when I would leave to go home, they'd be like, these are your, this is like your job, your homework is to go across the street and pick up these records. And every, every day it would be like a different, a different record, like Zenyatta Mandata by the police or, you know, Funkadelic like all kinds of stuff, all kinds of crazy stuff. So that was really kind of like, it was like I had a strong formation there uh, in regards to like, oh, I'm interested in music. And then I start hanging around this this, <laughs> this place. And yeah, it, it kind of like encouraged my passion. At what age is this? So that would have been 12. Yeah? Yeah. Very cool. So where yeah. are we now? We're at 99, 2000 kind of time. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 2000, yeah. So did all your siblings leave all their record collection at home for you to dive into? Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah. Basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not all of them, but my brother John left his records. Yeah. CDs upon CDs upon CDs. And... I'm like, I got huge into vinyl when I was a kid. So I've had a record player since I was probably around that age, like when right. I was in hanging out in this music store because of those record stores. It's so interesting, like being, again, like being one of the last generations pre-social media, because I still remember when all you had to go on as far as like knowing of an artist or knowing about an artist was like the record cover, the promotional pictures that they released and the interviews, if you could catch them on TV or in magazines, right? Now it's totally different. Yeah, so I remember just like the one of the biggest concerts or, or most impactful concerts for me when I was a kid was like going to see Kiss. Nice. And Kiss was like, so they hadn't come to Canada. Like I couldn't see them in Canada. And I was like so into this band. And, and this is back in the makeup, isn't it? This, the makeup's back on at this point. Yeah, so makeup's back on at this point. Uh, Peter Chris is still in the band, but Tommy Thayer's on guitar. So I remember my brother driving me down to Buffalo. Right. Darien Lake to go see Kiss because they hadn't been to Canada in like a decade. And I was like, I was like, this is probably going to be their last, you know, when am I going to see them again? Of course, they're still playing now. But I remember showing up at that concert and being like, so, oh, it was just bigger than life. Because again, all you had were the record covers and all you had were these like legendary interviews. And I didn't know anything. Who had you seen before that? My first concert was like Paul Simon. Right. Sweet. Um, my folks took me to that. That was really cool. And then what else did I had seen? Like... A bunch of bands that were like big at the time, like the Vines. Yep. Whatever happened to the Vines? I know, right? That that first <laughs> record, Highly Evolved, was great. In my opinion, it was great. So yeah, so a bunch of rock bands that were popular at the time, right? Like the smaller club circuit and stuff like that. But Kiss was like the first like older rock band that I'd seen. Yeah. yeah. And that's it's a pretty mind-blowing experience first time you see Kiss. <laughs> It definitely is, to say the least, yeah. Do you remember who was opening for them? Yeah, Saliva. Okay. Yeah, it was uh, It was like, I just remember standing there just being like, what's happening? You know, what's happening right now? Who were the first bands which you kind of got into, which kind of intrigued you into the whole songwriting process? You've actually described Summer of 69 as a songwriting masterclass, which I is, agree yeah. with. <laughs> I'm not going to yeah. disagree. Who can argue with that? Yeah, songwriting-wise, I mean, the, the bands that had like a really big influence on me growing up were... So there's like songwriting and then there's like bands. I, I make like a distinction. And that's not to say that bands aren't writing great songs. It's just, I don't know why I make that distinction in my head in regards to like why and how I'm listening. So for me, The Police had a huge impact on me growing up. That was probably my favorite band. Henry Rollins is like my guy. Yeah. I love Rollins as an artist and as a thinker. But songwriting wise, the greats to me are, or people who I've, who really resonate with me are Peter Gabriel, Don Henley, and Jim Valance, who for listeners wrote Summer of 69 uh, amongst many, many hits. Summer of 69, like when I was growing up, Brian Adams was, he was like omnipresent, you know, uh, in Canada. 
it, like I don't even remember really finding out about him. It was just like he always existed. Yeah. <laughs> like he was God. Um, like he was omnipresent in the way that like baseball is omnipresent or like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches exist. Like, and then there's like Brian Adams. Where is he actually from? He's from Vancouver. Okay, so the other side. Yeah, the other side. And uh, yeah, and Jim's from Vancouver. So I remember hearing like Brian Adams songs growing up and because I had been so exposed to him, kind of didn't pay attention until my teens when i got a i got a book like a do you remember mojo mojo was like a magazine right so mojo came out with a book though like of like best records of all time and of course i took it upon myself to like go out and buy and try and buy every record recommended by mojo um i just like went through the <laughs> went through the list of this book and reckless was like one of those records and i remember putting it on and hearing summer 69 and just being like this is one of the greatest songs of all time like it has to be so that was kind of like the pivot point for me with Adams where he went from kind of like this cultural kind of ambiguous presence constant but kind of ambiguous presence to me being like whoa like what's going on here so where did you kind of find the let's say the connection was you one of those avid people who just read all the album credits and liner notes so you're picking up on someone like Jim Valance to realize that it's not necessarily Brian Adams who's writing all these songs there's other people involved as well so when did you intrigue into all that kind of come about yeah pretty immediately i mean brian brian and jim they're it's a strong partnership yeah. they're you know they're, they are uh co-writers in the truest sense but i remember hearing that song again opening the liner notes like immediately seeing jim valance and at that point for me songwriting was kind of this elusive thing that the edges of it were fuzzy in, in regards to my understanding of how people did this um, and how people could pull off making such incredible cohesive pieces of art. And I don't think I'm alone in feeling that. I've seen footage of, actually Jim sent me a video of this. I've seen footage of Bob Dylan being asked, like, how did you write that song? And he literally says, I don't know. You know, so I don't think I'm alone in feeling like songwriting is this kind of mystery. Mm -hmm. But regardless, when I heard Adams, I was driven to figure out to to attempt to figure out what that mystery was about. I think there's like different sides to songwriting. Isn't it? You can be taught a certain amount on like structure and stuff like that. But then there's the other side of it where people say you just have to figure out how to, I don't know, open up some kind of window and let the songs in because they're there for the taking. You just got to figure out totally. how to grab totally. all of them. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, Lynch talks about David Lynch talks about he talks about he feels almost guilty taking credit for his ideas because he says that they they come out of nowhere mm -hmm. they're like these gifts from beyond or from somewhere else and essentially he is like the vessel that executes that gift like where do these ideas come from like who knows right like subconscious beyond i don't know it's just an interesting process did your friends share the same love of music as you or was you kind of a loner yeah well i grew up or i grew up in the avant-garde jazz world playing in that world so i grew up around uh, in high school, like I grew up around musicians who were very serious about music, highly competitive. And yet there was like strong camaraderie being at an art school and, and playing in the jazz world, which is, yeah. it's intense. So yeah, I did uh, share a love for music with my peers. However, I didn't find a strong kingship like genre wise until I was like much older because because I went to an art school there was literally everything there mm -hmm. every expression of music almost like except the music that I loved you know there was like all kinds of fusion happening there was like new wave happening uh electronic stuff happening jazz stuff happening really old kind of Motown R&B stuff happening and then I was like okay I'm the rock punk kid like let's go <laughs> and everyone was like ah you sell out you know <laughs> yeah um, so I didn't really kind of like find my people in regards to like those subcultures of punk rock, rock and roll. Uh, I didn't discover that community until I graduated. Right. And, then, and when I graduated, I was like, you know what? I don't know anyone who wants to do this, so I'll just do it myself. So how was your like time through school? Because you've mentioned a guy called Doug Friesen, who you cited as a big influence. Uh, where did he come into the whole picture? Yeah, so for those listening, Doug Friesen was my high school music teacher. I feel like the common conception of music teachers is that they're like, you know, old and reserved and, you know, you're running these scales and etc. But Doug Friesen was probably around five years older than me when I was in high school, probably like 20, a bit of an outsider 
And the art school that I went to was really unconventional. Uh, there wasn't a strong curriculum. Basically, it was about encouraging and inspiring kids to want to show up right, and to want to enjoy school and to thrive in that setting. So through that, I know Friesen, you know, he was like uh, strongly educated in the world of like free jazz, which was basically like getting into like what is sound basically, or what is music and songwriting and stuff like that. So it was totally outside of anything I'd ever heard before. Like you're learning how to make music with objects, like literally anything, like anything that you can make a noise with, you're making songs and recording it. That was just like such a free atmosphere to be in. So he had like an incredible impact on me for sure. That must be great to be at a school and having someone you could have mics. Most people don't enjoy school. It's a chore to go to school and all that kind of thing. So that must have been great to be excited to be taking all this knowledge yeah it was like a really exciting uh really exciting period of my life and what's really cool about it is there's been like this explosion of like career musicians that have come from studying with Doug so that's kind of like the proof is in the pudding right like there are a number of kids who've gone on to make like significant contributions to the Toronto music scene and beyond um I actually think that's so cool there's a spark happening there like a scene almost yeah did that kind of give you confidence to see music as a career because most times it's put down like oh yeah keep that as a hobby but then find something as a, a real job right Right. But you always had the confidence to say, right, I can make a go of this. Yeah, I think that being surrounded by so many professional musicians from some, such a young age, it always seemed like a viable career choice to me. Like I said, like the art school that I went to was such an unconventional school combined with like I I struggled with a learning disability for years. I don't even want to say that I struggled with it, but I... It was a challenge. Something you had to adapt, which other people didn't have to. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh So I graduated school with honors, which was like incredible. I graduated high school with honors, but thinking my belief about myself was that I wasn't good at school. So I think that music and Friesen, I think part of it was like facilitating an atmosphere for people to realize their dreams and their potential. How cool is that? (laughs) So cool. So cool. And then... And and for me at the time, you know, when you're a kid, you're not necessarily thinking incredibly in an in incredibly nuanced way. So for me, I was like, I suck at school. So this is what I'm doing. Like, this is going to be my viable career path. Mm-hmm. And now as an adult, I'm like, you know what? I don't, I actually don't suck at school. It's, it's a matter of like facilitating that passion. You know, it's like, I've gone on to, to work on a master's degree and do well with it. So it's about finding that passion and facilitating an atmosphere for learning and for making mistakes. Like how weird is it that our education system is not to go on a diatribe about this, but how weird is it that our education s- system is about like is based on like getting things perfect or getting things right when prime learning is about failing and then figuring out what to do next yeah like that's so strange to me <laughs> i don't know about your experience man but i get you on that it's like I, i've always realized this stuff far too late <laughs> that's my problem <laughs> i hear you dude <laughs> i feel you're someone who considers anything to be possible certainly from the point of view that you feel you can reach out to people who most people would consider untouchable and through that you've been able to work and gain advice from i mean just a few minutes ago you casually dropped that you received a video or from jim valance who wrote for brian adams and that's because you reached out to him to get songwriting advice can you just dive into that whole kind of experience yeah yeah so i've known jim over a decade he's been like a really important mentor to me um a really important friend to me the guy who you you read in the brian adams line yeah (laughs) i mean how crazy is that right well that's what i mean most people wouldn't even consider thinking that's a viable thing to do to try and reach out to them Uh, yeah i don't know viable is, is is the right word but i think that for me i yeah so i i basically got to a place in my career where i was hearing songs that i loved i was unclear on how to get my songs to you know a place remotely in the same arena and and by and what i mean by that is like what i mean by that is like not i do not mean making music to sell records I mean, like making a song, creating a song that gives me the same feeling I get when I listen to those songs. So just to be (laughs) clear about that. So yeah, so due to that frustration that I had where I was like, I am not getting the feeling that I want and the song isn't turning out the way that I want it to. I recognize that I do not know everything (laughs) about everything, uh, particularly songwriting. And I was like, you know what, but I want to learn. So at that time, I got in touch with Jim 
and shot him an email and explained, you know, my situation and my love for his music. And I asked him if he wanted to meet and he was kind of like, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> and uh, I was like, totally cool. But do you mind if I keep in touch with you? Um, I was like, do you mind if I just send you my songs periodically? Like, I'm not going to email you every day, you know? And I was like, I just need some feedback. Like, basically, I'm asking you to, can you just like pull my songs apart and tell me what I'm doing wrong here or what I could be doing better anyway? And he was like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> so we sent emails back and forth for a good two years, you know, him facilitating kind of like feedback and maybe try this here, maybe try that there. And me being like, oh, I was listening to this song that you wrote. And, you know, what were you thinking when you did that and, and all that? And uh, he was like very generous with his time and his feedback. And that was such a cool um, experience for me. And then two, about two years in, I just remember re reaching a point again with a frustration being like, my songs aren't it's not there yet. And I emailed Jim and I was like, I will come out to Vancouver and shovel your driveway for a whole Canadian winter, which in Vancouver, they don't get a lot of snow. But at the time, it felt like the right thing to offer, right? I was like, I'll come out there and shovel your driveway for a whole Canadian winter if you talk to me for 15 minutes about songwriting. Like, I just need to ask you a few questions. And he was like, you know what? I'm actually in Toronto. Let's have a coffee and you can ask me those questions. And that meeting kind of like began this journey of like mentorship and, and just me reshaping uh, or delving deeper anyway into the art of songwriting. How nervous was you on that first meeting? Oh, I was nervous. I was nervous, mostly because like you totally have to surrender your ego, right? You're like, if you want to get anything out of it, you have to be totally honest about what you don't know. Yeah. So I'm going in there asking him like the most basic questions um, about lyrics, about structure, about, yeah, about uh, how to be as clear and direct as you can be with, with self-expression. Did I um, see Bob Rock was thrown into? Yeah. What was that whole advent? I'm going to call it an adventure. I have no idea what happened. <laughs> yeah, definitely an adventure. Uh, I actually, I met Bob through Jim and Bob is, um, like I said, like I gravitate. I'm really inspired by people who are behind the scenes. So I've been a really big fan of like, you asked me about artists that impact me and like Bob Rock is essentially an artist yeah i mean he had his band the payolas but also he's an artist as a producer and as an engineer and as a mixer and as a songwriter yeah so i really wanted to work with bob uh with my band the dead idols i just thought that there was no other producer that i wanted to work with so if there's no other producer that you want to work with then why not try and make this happen and you know i really felt like he had a really strong vision for or we had a vision. I felt like he would understand what we were about, what we wanted to do because he'd made these records that we just loved. So yeah, so I had a number of meetings with Bob and spent some time in the studio with him. Again, uh, he was very generous and he's a lovely, lovely guy, very kind. You know, I had like a bunch of questions like, how do you make your snare sound like this? You know, like those kind of like, he was like, ah, oh, just come, just come hang out in the studio and, and wow. you can watch. Where was he based out of at that point? Well, so he was in Hawaii, but... At that point, he was making a record at the warehouse, which is Brian Adams' uh, studio in Vancouver. Yeah. That was just like such, a, such an incredible uh, experience to spend time with him and just watch him work. And I mean, that's like, you know, something I'll, I'll have for the rest of my life. So, I mean, he's a legend, right? Just a bit. Just a bit. Yeah. <laughs> so where did your band, The Dead Idols, kind of come about? Because that's obviously where I heard about you. My career so far has been about balancing three different streams, which is uh, one is my own band, The Dead Idols. Another is being a touring musician for other artists. So I've played for uh, like major label artists, which afforded me the opportunity to tour with like Demi Lovato and One Republic as a as a guitarist, uh, opening for those bands. And then the third stream is songwriting and producing for other artists. So the Dead Idols, in regards to like my own independent band, was the first band that I had traction with. But it's always been about kind of like balancing these other streams that I've also had like a lot of experience and a lot of traction with. So the Dead Idols to me is like was like a really special project because it came out of it came out of like being a teenager. Like that was kind of the dream band that I wanted to make, you know, that I'd always dreamt about having. And, you know, the guys were great. And uh, it was like a long Dan Cavalcante, the other guitar player, you know, we'd uh, been in the band together for 10 years. So mm -hmm. I, I just love the idea of there aren't bands anymore. No, you know, those are kind of like long term. You're just like, no, 
<laughs> there's not. <laughs> no, there is. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Yeah, like those long-term relationships. Like, can you believe, like, what what must it be like for, you know, David Lee Roth to have just lost Eddie Van Halen? Like, that, that kind of, like, long-term, lifelong relationship. I'm kind of sad that those aren't common anymore. Right. So for me, that was like something that I really was passionate about exploring. Mm -hmm. And the Dead Idols was that, yeah. How far afield was your touring and stuff like that? Did you just kind of focus around Toronto? Yeah. So the Dead Idols, I, yeah, we toured around Canada. We toured across Canada. We went down to different parts of the United States. Uh, mostly for like South by Southwest. Mm -hmm. And that was the extent of of our touring. We we never got to the UK, which I'm bummed about. How did the whole Bon Jovi and Kiss thing come about? Well, Bon Jovi, there was like a contest in Toronto and Q107, which was like a really big radio station in Toronto at the time, uh, hosted that contest. And I think Bon Jovi was holding these contests city to city. They did it worldwide. They did it in the UK as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's so cool, right? Because I mean, at the time, those kinds of gigs were like few and far between. So he, yeah, so he picked uh, our band and he picked another band called, did you ever hear of Dean LaCure? No, I don't think so. Okay, they were a kick-ass Canadian band. Uh, they've broken up since, but so they he, they played like a double bill, Bon Jovi in Toronto, and we played one night and Dean LaCure right. played the next night. And then Kiss came about through uh, Coalition Management, which is a management company in Toronto, who I think recommended us for the gig and and have have been uh, supporters of us for a long time. So that was like a crazy experience to tour across Canada with them. How many shows did you do with them? I think it was five. Yeah? Yeah, I think. I don't know if you go back and count. This was a while ago. Was you treated well? Yeah, they were everything that you want them to be. Yeah? Totally. What was the reception from the crowd? Because I think KISS fans can be quite harsh because they're, they're there to see KISS. <laughs> and that's kind of it. Yeah, I mean, you're standing up on stage and these like, you know, face painted stone faces are facing you. And you're just like, oh my gosh. Like, And I get it, dude. I've been in that audience, right? Just like, who is this band? No, yeah, I... I found the audience to be very generous. Yeah? Yeah, I did. And we made a lot of friends and met a lot of new people on that tour. And I looked at it like, (laughs) how did I look at it? I looked at it like, like I felt that I felt uh, challenged by it. Like I was like, when you guys over, because I, in my heart, like I felt really confident in my band. I felt really confident in us as players. And I felt like the spirit, like that we understood the spirit of rock and punk rock and and i felt like that would come across like the genuine that genuine kind of like i'm like these are my people like Mm -hmm. i didn't feel like we were on a bill with a band that you know those bills that are just like mismatched yeah you know i've played those and i've seen those and you're just kind of like what's happening here i didn't feel that so i felt like you know by the seventh song of the set uh when you see the kiss fans get on their feet you know you got them nice Nice. yeah it was awesome (laughs) it's a highlight for sure did you ever like have any kind of flashback moments because obviously you'd seen kiss from the crowd could you ever have imagined being on the same stage i mean it was like definitely a goal and i think as a kid i'm definitely one of those people where if i set my mind to something i won't let it go and i know that you know duncan coots who's been like a really important person in my story as a musician. He's from the band Our Lady Peace, uh, who basically developed the Dead Idols with me. He uh, is a huge Kiss fan too. So we bonded early over Kiss. I think that the fact that there were two of us who really wanted this to happen. And I think at that point, at that point, Our Lady Peace hadn't opened for Kiss. They have since, you know, yeah. since then. At that point, they hadn't. So the, so he, I think it was like either we were going to do it, like if OLP wasn't going to do it, then we were going to do it and he was going to be there. So I think that between the two of us, we just like had to make it happen somehow. So good. So um, we said we mentioned it was through MySpace, which we met. How did that whole platform impact you guys? Did it open up a whole new world for you? Can you remember actually discovering it? Yeah, I remember getting on MySpace pretty early on. What I would say about MySpace is that we made a ton of friends through MySpace. You know, the, the viral thing, like wasn't part of our story where you know that uh the nonprofit like to write love on our arms like they blew up through myspace Mm -hmm. but for me it was a a platform to make and foster like really strong friendships and like such as yourself and joey strange and uh, my buddy kent rocks who's a dj in saskatchewan it was like it it was exciting did you find that era of social media like the early days of social media exciting it was so good. I mean, that's what yeah. got us to America to play for the first time was through meeting bands through MySpace and stuff. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just like the fun. And I remember showing a picture of you guys to my guitar player, Dan. Like he was like, bands like this exist? <laughs> 
Because like literally us and um, Dean LaCure and are you familiar with Diamonds? Go on. Okay, they're a Canadian uh, rock band, like come up around the same time as us. But there was like very kind of like not a ton of like rock bands or like punk rock bands like in Canada. And so I remember Dan just like seeing the cover of like Teenage Casket Company and just being like <laughs> blown away that, that those bands existed. <laughs> So did you cross paths with like like the Robin Black guys and Crash Kelly and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so Sean Kelly is a really good friend of mine. Oh, nice. Incredible guitar player from Crash Kelly. We played gigs together back in the day a ton. And Robin Black, I grew up with him on like music television, but I don't think we've ever actually met. Like I've seen him around. I don't think we've ever actually met, but uh, yeah, crazy band. They were like a, a game changer band for me as well. Were they a MySpace thing? Must have been because it was like 04, 05 kind of time. Cool, cool, cool. I mean, I just remember them from from watching them on Much Music. Yeah. So like pre MySpace, like when I was a kid. Oh yeah, well yeah, they were probably over there. Yeah, because they're from Toronto, right? Yeah. So I just remember them being like they were rock and roll for sure. Yeah. <laughs> So um, how have recent events in your life affected your view on music and just life in general? Yeah, I mean, I'm so I I wanted to make an announcement on this podcast about a new chapter. Uh, I'm working on a new project right now, uh, a new music project. I'm working on a record right now, which I'm really excited about. I don't want to say too much about it because I'm one of those people who is really cagey about what they're currently working on until it's <laughs> kind of finished. I haven't talked about this publicly announced the end of the dead idols chapter and the beginning of a new chapter that I'm really stoked about. Yeah. And, and a big, you know, factor in determining that was, uh, I went through a health crisis over the past five years that I will get into publicly, uh, in the not so far off future, but pretty early on into that, I asked myself if this was the time to, to shift and to make a transition and to do something new from a creative perspective. Was I hitting a ceiling on on my creativity in regards to that project? Because we worked on that project for 10 years. And I was really proud of that project. I was really proud of the work that everyone had put into it and that it was being recognized by people that I believed in, you know, the Jim Valances and the Bob Rocks and the Duncan Coots and, and that. So I just felt like creatively, this this was like a clear time in my life to make that transition. What are the next 10 years going to look like, right? So that's where I'm at right now, just exploring that. I'm really excited to, to share with everyone what I'm working on. Where are you with music now? What's kind of fuels you and gets you excited today? I'm listening to a lot of like, I mean, still the the classics, like the Pumpkins and, you know, Tom Petty and, and that kind of stuff. I'm also into like uh, Daniel Davies. So he works on a lot of stuff with John Carpenter. Very kind of like thematic, mm -hmm. interesting stuff. I love the night game. Do you know the night game? No, you're firing all these new ones at me. <laughs> All right. The night game is pretty cool. Uh, Martin Johnson is a producer. He was in a band called Boys Like Girls. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. They yeah. Great. Totally great. And he actually went a similar route as I did. Are they from Boston. Yeah. 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 So he went on a similar route after or alongside Boys Like Girls as I did, which is writing for other artists. And I think at a certain point he got really burnt out, like just being stretched creatively and stuff like that. And, and so he decided to do this new project. He was either like, I'm going to quit music or I'm going to do this new project. And see what happens with it. And he started this new project. And how do I describe it? It is like if Patrick Swayze had was if Patrick Swayze I'm was in. John Mellencamp, <laughs> right? Like, dude. So you know, like Stranger Things, how everything in Stranger Things. I don't know if you're a fan of Stranger Things in the first season, anyway. Everything about Stranger Things was like every reference, visually and auditorily. If that's a word, but like in the auditory sense. They were so spot on. Like you could tell that the people who made Stranger Things loved this era of mm -hmm. time so much because of the details. That's how I feel about the night game. Like the night game, the details from like the shoes to the chain, like he's got like the gold chain, like the 80s gold chain to the, the guitar and, right. and the, the gated snare, like the snare drum sounds amazing. Definitely check it out. So I'm, I'm listening to, to a lot of that these days too. Thank you ever so much. Dude, it's been a blast talking to you. It's been the best. Yeah, Loved yeah, it. definitely uh, keep in touch and let's have a tea sometime.
a lot of fun talking to my old myspace buddy frankie white and thanks to frankie for sending over an unreleased killer dead idols track which you just heard called the devil never sleeps i'm excited to hear all about frankie's new musical chapter which he spoke about so hopefully we can get her back onto the podcast again and maybe share some of that new music with you guys the frankie white and the dead idols page is still active on facebook if you wanted to head on over and check it out and whilst you're there please drop a share for the straight to video podcast or maybe tag some friends in who might enjoy our chats we're getting close to 50 episodes now which should tie in just with the new year and i've got some great chats in the bag with some awesome folks so can't wait to share those with you all so thank you for the great support of the straight to video podcast i look forward to speaking to you all again real soon (laughs) 